Our worship service is beginning. I invite those of you at home to light a candle during the prelude so that we may all share in the light of Christ during this time. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. welcome you to our service this morning uh, through our Facebook live streaming. My name is Memory Stuns and it is my honor to be your liturgist this morning. Uh, and We wish all of you both here and virtually out in uh, all areas of Tulsa and around the country, good morning from St. Paul's. Um, we have a few staff members and essential volunteers here in the sanctuary. So we're really glad that you are all with us. It would be really helpful if you would like our live stream so that we know that you are watching and we can picture where you're sitting in the sanctuary. Kathy? Uh, good morning. Good morning, St. Paul's United Methodist Church, for those of you that are in our sanctuary with us. And memory, I have to add on yours, not just those around the country, we actually have some outside of the United States who join us for worship. So what a joy it really is to, to have all of you with us. And you know, I think that is one of the unexpected blessings from COVID is that uh, we and so many other churches have begun live streaming so that we can include those from our church family and those who are becoming a part of our church family through the gift of technology. I have one announcement that I want to make and I will send more information out on this through our Facebook page and through our email, but I want you all to get it on your calendar um, as soon as possible. As you know, November 3rd is our election. Um, it is probably one of the most divisive elections that, that we have faced, at least in my voting lifetime. Uh, the Interfaith Alliance will be having a candlelight vigil the night before voting, so Monday night at 6 o'clock. It will be with masks and social distancing at 6 o'clock in the north parking lot of Boston Avenue. Again, I will send out more information later. But uh, for as many of us that can be there, I think that is a good time for us to come together as a faith community to show our support for a peaceful election. Friends, it is truly a joy to have you in worship today. Uh, and Phyllis, after that beautiful prelude, I have to say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Absolutely. So let us, oh, let's pray first and then we'll stand and sing. Will you join me in prayer? Oh God, we do indeed give you thanks for this day. This day that you called us to come together as a community to worship you and to give praise and to give thanks to you. 
that you have called us together as a community so that we can be reminded of who you are and whose we are. So God, we ask that during this time especially, that you help us to be fully present to you. We know we don't ever have to ask us to ask you to join us because wherever we are, you indeed are always there. So instead, God, we ask that you help us to make this time a time of focus, a time of worship, a time of renewal, so that through word and through music and just through the swirling around of your Holy Spirit, we can experience the risen Christ. And when our worship service ends, we indeed we will be transformed. Amen. Now, let us stand and those of you at home sing boldly and joyfully, and the rest of us will put on our mask or keep our masks on and sing uh, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. We're only going to sing verses 1, 3, 1, 3, and 5 uh, today. Number 160 in your hymnal. Or I'm sure. standing and join me in the call to worship as printed peace first oh that's right thank you so much that's okay yes. that's an important part of our DNA yes it is <laughs> all right yes before that we're going to pass the peace of Christ and we invite you to share signs of peace with those that are with you wherever you are st. Paul's United Methodist Church welcomes and extends our love to all persons, regardless of age, race, income, nationality, life experiences, sexual orientation, or gender identity. All are welcome into our family. You are invited to greet one another with signs of God's peace. Peace be with you. And also with you. Peace be with you. Peace of Christ. And now, if you would, join me in the call to worship, which will appear on your screen or is printed in your bulletin. In the times of darkness and fear, God is ever near to love and guide us. God, in our hearts. In the times of joy and dancing, God is ever near in celebration. At all times and in all places, God is always with us, sustaining, 
healing, loving. Fill our hearts with love. join me in the affirmation of faith that will appear on your screen. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And if the children would gather around the screen for children's time with Kathleen Lee. All right. This place is where children belong, welcomed as part of the worshiping throng. Water cuts were bread and cup, prayer and song. This is where children belong. Oops. <laughs> Good morning. 
warning, boys and girls. See, grown-ups make mistakes all the time. It's no big deal, I hope. This is indeed where children belong. And maybe one of these days, real soon, you all can be back here because I miss you terribly. I miss your hugs and your smiles and your sweet faces. This is such an odd time in our lives, and I've lived a long time. It's just a time of wearing masks and people being cranky with one another and not being nice to one another and not telling the truth and just all kinds of crazy stuff. And poor Miss Tana, I find myself being a lot like Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore. <laughs> poor Eeyore, God love him, he is so sad all the time. And it's okay, I guess, if you love me, but I don't know what to do with it. So, all we want to do is give Eeyore a hug. Eeyore is just hopeless. I even brought you a picture so you could see what he looks like. He is just pitiful. It's not good to be hopeless. And because we believe in God, we are not hopeless. We are not without hope. Hope is a lot like wishing, but it isn't. I wish a lot of things were different. I wish I had a lot of money. I wish I could travel around the world, but that's probably not gonna happen. But I hope I'm healthy, and I hope I get to see you before too long. And hope is different because I know, I believe that I will get to see you soon. I know that will happen, and that's what hope is. We all have to have hope when things aren't going very well, when things are out of our control. I can't make everybody wear a mask. I can't make everybody well, but I hope and I trust in God that it will happen, and I hope it happens soon. So think about Eeyore, and think about the things he never tried to do, because he was hopeless. He was without hope, and you have hope, because you trust in God, just like I do, and you know things will get better, and you know you can be a part of that. So we are not hopeless. You all take care. Remember, I love you, and let's say a prayer. Loving God, you are indeed our hope and our strength, and we thank you for that. We thank you for being your children, whether we are old or young. In your son's name, amen. Our reading from the Psalter this morning is Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. that time in our service where we lift our joys and our concerns up to God with the confidence of being God's children and knowing that God does indeed hear our prayers. Kathleen, your um, children's moment reminded me that the children of this church are one of our greatest joys. And I want to say to the parents and the grandparents and the aunts and uncles, those of you that have faithfully made sure that church is a part of your children's lives. Not only does it enrich them, but it enriches us. Um, It has been seven months since your children have joined us in church, and the one consistent comment I hear from people is, I miss seeing our kids, because our children are definitely those who reflect the joy and the life of Christ. So, For the children, not just in our church, but the children around the world, Lord, in your mercy. And for all of the things that are going on in our world today, uh, things with our election, things with COVID, things with our leaders, we lift all of those up. And I'll give you just a moment of silence to lift specific things dealing with our world and our nation in prayer. Lord, in your mercy. And a moment to lift up friends, co-workers, people that you know that are in need of prayer. Lord, in your mercy. And now I encourage all of us to lift ourselves in prayer, to share with God what is on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, and for all of those whom no one lifts in prayer. Lord, in your mercy. Oh dear gracious and loving God, we do indeed give you thanks. Thanks that you are a God who wants us to pray without ceasing, to continually talk and share with you, to share our joys, to share our concerns, to share our frustrations, to share ourselves. You never get tired of hearing us. So God, we give you thanks that you have called us out of the wilderness, that you have led us to this place at this time. Remind us that we have no other gods before you. Help us to make you the center of our lives. Help us to see the world through the love and the compassion of your Son, the one who showed, who pointed to you in all that he did. God, it is admittedly hard for us to always be faithful to that call. We stumble and we slide, yet you are still there with us. When we fall, you reach out a hand to pick us up, but before you dust us off, 
you hug us and you hold us and you whisper in our ear, you are my beloved child. And no matter how many times you stumble, I will pick you up. So God, we ask that you fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your courage. Fill us with your grace. Let the forgiveness and mercy that you fill us up with, let it splash out on all those in our midst. God, we ask all these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Adam. 
Um, you know, I love the way of God's divine timing. Adam had this song chosen long before I knew where God was going to take us with this morning sermon. And Adam, we couldn't have picked a better song to fit with today's message of hope, so thank you. <clears throat> this morning scripture comes from a letter, that which we call an epistle, from Paul to the Christians living in Philippi. Philippi was a Roman colony in the province of <clears throat> Macedonia. It's a place where Paul had been about 10 years earlier, and he founded the church there, a church with women leaders. You know I? You, you Adoa? I practiced this, I bet, 25 times. You Odiah. You Odiah was the woman's name. The woman's name was You Odiah, and her friend was Sintiki. You Odiah and Sintiki. They were women who Paul refers to, not in a subservient, dismissive manner, but rather as co workers of his, co workers in mission and ministry. So friends, when people use the Bible to say that women should not be in leadership in the churches, and yes, even in 2020, some still do, it is just another example of the misuse of Scripture as a tool of oppression under the guise of, but it's God's will. Now scholars are not sure of exactly where Paul is writing this letter from, but we know that it's from a prison cell. Now, before I read this, so that you totally grasp the power of his words, you have to understand that Paul is writing this not from a cozy prison cell with amenities such as running water and food and health care, but he's writing it from a dark, crowded, musty, often extremely hot or extremely cold cell, one that is filled with disease and that has little or no food. In the church of Philippi, they were continuing to encourage Paul and praying for Paul, and they supported him by sending him food and clothing. So Paul is writing this letter to thank them and to encourage them and to remind them of their life in Christ. I'll be reading from Philippians 4. 1 through 9. Therefore, my siblings, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Od you Odiah, and I urge Sintiki, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, Help these women, for they have struggled beside me in work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, that which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing these things, those that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Will you go with me to God in prayer? Oh, dear gracious and loving God, at this time I ask that you help me to step back. Fill me with your spirit so that it is your word, not mine, that is heard. So that it is your word that lands in our hearts. So that it is your words that lead us to transformation. And may all the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. For indeed, gracious God, it is you 
that is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, there are so many things that I love about this scripture, one of which I already mentioned, the naming of women leaders in the church who Paul refers to as co-workers with him. We have so many stories in the Bible of unnamed women, but Paul clearly identifies these two by name, giving them the proper acknowledgement that they deserve as leaders of the church. But I also like that Paul acknowledges that there is some disagreement in the church. You, Odiah and Syntyche, they are disagreeing about something. Now, we don't know what it's about. I can only guess that maybe it's the color of the new carpeting that they're going to put in the sanctuary, or how often to have potluck fellowship dinners. And I just have to make a side note and say, oh, friends, I miss our potluck fellowship dinners. I long for the day when I don't have to eat my cooking, that I can eat your cooking, but that we can be together in fellowship. Or maybe they're arguing about which hymns to sing or how much to spend on the new air conditioner or what mission project they're going to undertake. Or maybe they're arguing about where the church is going to stand on issues of social justice. You see, Paul doesn't tell us the specifics, but just acknowledging the disagreement reminds us that whenever two or more are gathered, yes, Christ is among us, but there is also room for disagreement. And Paul, rather than just settling the argument, simply urges them to be of the same mind in Christ. It's a phrase that Paul uses often. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Wow, that's a good reminder for all of us, but especially when we have differing points of view with others. Can we just approach those disagreements with others with the same mind of Christ? Now, I don't know about you, but I have to admit that at times when I'm in a disagreement with someone, I want to try to convince them of my point of view. But that's not what Paul says. Paul simply says, as you are trying to work this out, approach it, both of you, from the perspective of Jesus. Work it out with compassion and understanding. And don't look at your individual needs, but look at what is best for the community. And then Paul says to the others, to those around them, Help them stay grounded as they work through this. You see, my friends, Paul is reminding us that when we are in a community, differences will exist. Arguments will occur. But he urges us to work it out through your common ground of love and commitment to Christ rather than what is best for me personally. Friends, we are only 23 days from an election that has divided our country. And sadly, it has divided family and friends. One of the blessings that I have as an only child is that I don't have family members who will be voting differently than I will. You see, I don't have to deal with those awkward and awful, often painful family gatherings where politics has become so hurtful and destructive. You see, this election season is much more than a name we check on the ballot. It's about values that we hold on to dearly. And how do we stay connected to and remain in relationship with family and friends who have different values that will be deciding their vote? I think many families, even spouses, have simply agreed not to talk politics. Yet there is that underlying tension that exists and it's often painful. A friend of mine told me the other day, tearfully, it's hard for me to even talk to my brother. He wants the marriage equality ruling to be overturned. And then she went on to say, that directly impacts me and my wife. He's my brother, she said. He knows who I am, and that's his number one priority for who he is casting his vote for. And she said, every time I look at him or every time I talk to him, I feel betrayed. 
Friends, there are so many stories like this on a variety of issues this election season, many of which some of you are dealing with. And I don't have answers for my friend. She's already dreading that Thanksgiving family gathering. But what I can say to her and what I can say to you if you are going through this is stay grounded in what you believe to be consistent with the mind of Christ. Now that doesn't take away your pain and your hurt. It doesn't heal your relationship with your brother. But it allows allows you to have integrity in your responses. To know that your support of marriage equality isn't just about you and your wife. It's about equality across so many spectrums of our society. Stand for what you believe in. Stand with the same mind as Christ. The one who taught us to stand up for the underserved, to stand up for the oppressed, and to stand up for those whose liberties have been taken away or diminished. And yes, sadly, sometimes that means that relationships are wounded, sometimes beyond repair. And friends, those relationships if they can't be repaired, need to be grieved. Yes, broken relationships add to our time of grief. And for those of you that are going through this now, for those of you that have damaged relationships because of this divisive election season, please, please know that my heart and my prayers are with you as you grieve these broken relationships. Now, I don't have a do this and all will be better suggestion. But I do encourage each of you to pray about it often. Tell God about your heartache. Pray for your family member. Pray for your friend. And pray that God will show you your next steps. Steps that allow you to protect yourself from further harm. But steps that will also build a bridge between you and your family member. Pray that you can approach this relationship with the same mind of Christ. And then, listen. Listen to where God is leading you. And I would also encourage you to find somebody safe that you can talk to about your strained relationship. Because when we keep those things bottled up inside of us, it can cause us, it can cause them to fester and to ooze out into other parts of our life. Yes, Damaged relationships seem to abound in so many different aspects of our lives right now. And it adds to the weariness, the weariness of 2020 that we are dealing with. Ironically, a few years ago, there was much written on what was referred to as news weariness. Weariness that was attributed to, to people spending too much time watching the news. Ironically, Psychologists were being interviewed on news programs telling people to turn off the news and to find other ways to capture joy. And now, on this day, we are dealing with COVID weariness. You know that weariness. Seven months in and the numbers are still climbing. You are tired of wearing masks, but you continue to do it because you care about others. You are tired of not being able to gather with family and friends, tired of not being able to go to a movie theater or to your favorite restaurant, tired of worrying about your children or about your parents and about your own health. And for the first time in your life, daily decisions include, will it be safe for me to do this. Friends, that wears us out. And yes, we are COVID weary and it is impacting our mental health. We are finding that we are depressed or anxious. Kathleen talked about being short-tempered and impatient. Relationships, even those of people that we politically agree with, are strained. And the joy and excitement of simply being alive has lost some of its appeal. Now, first, let me be very clear. For those of you that are dealing with this weariness, it is very real. And it is not something that a daily pep talk will make it magically disappear. I read this week that the American Psychiatric Association is looking at adding COVID weariness as a legitimate mental health diagnosis. Yes, friends, 
our mental health is at stake. A few weeks ago, I mentioned that God hears our complaining and that God sends us manna, but that we have to pick up that manna, put it in our mouths, and let it feed and nurture us. And sometimes that manna comes in the form of mental health professionals. And so please, if your weariness is at a level that concerns you or it concerns your family and friends, please seek professional help. Do not hesitate to reach out and call me, email me, or call others and let us help you find some of those mental health resources. Because my friends, we do indeed have stressors in our midst. COVID, election season, a record-breaking hurricane season, which reminds me I forgot to lift up the people in Louisiana that have been hit two times within six weeks of a devastating hurricane. So I'm going to stop right now and just lift them up in prayer. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. <clears throat> so the hurricane season, wildfires, racial tensions, economic uncertainty, political tensions and divisions, strained relationships, keeping dealing with keeping your children safe at school or those of you that are trying to help your kids with virtual learning. And yes, added to all those stressors, the future of the United Methodist Church. We've put that on the back burner, but it still looms before us and in <clears throat> 2021 will be dealt with. All these factors add to our weariness. They are powerful, powerful issues that take our time, our energy, and yes, they often dampen our hopes. I don't know about you, but I have not heard anyone say to me recently, wow, I love this time that we are going through. It is the best time in my life. No, for some, this is a season in their life when all hope seems to be lost when all hope seems to be lost. And what does Paul tell us to do? Rejoice! Rejoice! Really, Paul? In the midst of all this, you want us to rejoice? Yes, absolutely he does. Because, my friends, we are a people of hope, and Paul wants to remind us of that. He doesn't say, rejoice in what is going on around you. He doesn't say rejoice in the election madness and COVID and all of the natural disasters. No. He tells us to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice because God is near. And friends, that indeed is something with which we can rejoice even when all hope seems lost. It's the cornerstone and the foundation of our faith that God is with us. That's what Emmanuel means. Emmanuel, God with us. And even when we can't see it, even when we can't feel it, God is beside us and we are not alone. And you have to remember, Paul is not telling this from the beaches in the Mediterranean where he is laying in the sun drinking a pina colada. No, he is saying rejoice in the Lord from his prison cell. And it's not a lush federal prison system for white collar criminals. No, he is writing rejoice in the Lord from a rat infested, dark, musky, stinky, crowded cell. And he's not saying rejoice because I'm in prison. He's reminding us, rejoice, because God's been here before and God's going to be with us every single step of the way. Even on those days when we don't want to get up off the couch, God is with us. God is with us on those days when we can't seem to muster any energy at all. God's with us, not shaming us, not telling us to do better, not giving us platitudes that will make us somehow feel better, but simply sitting with us. Rejoice. We are not alone. I remember when I had knee surgery a few years ago, 
I was in the hospital, and the third day was the worst. The pain block had worn off. Some of you know what that felt like. It hurt, and I was miserable. And a friend of mine walked in the door, and I remember saying, Oh, I am so glad you're here. I didn't say, I'm glad I'm here in this excruciating pain. But I said, I am glad you're here. That's what made me rejoice. And friends, that's what God wants us to rejoice in. Not the circumstances of our lives, but the acknowledgement of God's presence, even during those times when we are weary. Rejoice in God's presence, even when we don't feel it. You see, I have learned during these last seven months that it is so easy to rejoice when we see God in the sunrise or in the sunset. It's easy to rejoice when we see God in the eyes of a newborn baby or in the blooming flowers in our garden. But Paul says rejoice in the Lord even when our weariness feels like a cold, dark prison cell. Now I will admit that that acknowledgement doesn't make the dis difficult circumstances of our life go away. It's not a poof, God's here, so everything's going to be sunshine and roses. No, it is though a blessed assurance that the Spirit of God, the presence of the one who breathed life into us, the one who created order out of chaos, has not abandoned us, has not forgotten us, and has not moved on to bigger and brighter things. But instead, that God has plopped down in the chair right beside us and said, I'm here. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how many tears you cry, no matter how hard you try to push me away, I'm here and I will always be here. You see, friends, Paul's words remind us not to simply look for God's presence during hard and difficult times, but to expect God's presence during that time. That is a hope that can never be taken away from us. Hope. Hope. Friends, it is the wellspring of our Christian faith. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, yes, there are hard times, but rejoice. The Lord your God is with you. Remember the first line of the psalm that memory read earlier. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord. My friends, we are living in what some refer to what is known as liminal times, those living in between times, those in between times of we're not where we were, but we're not where we're yet going. I've heard liminal times described <clears throat> compared to a trapeze artist. It's those times in our lives where we have the bar and we swing off the platform, and the liminal time is that time when we let go as we wait for that next bar to come to us. It's that moment where we are suspended in air. We haven't yet reached that swinging bar that's coming towards us. Yes, those liminal times are times of uncertainty. They're filled with anticipation and anxiety because we're not exactly sure what we will find on the other side of them. A few days ago, I was walking my dog, Sam. Now, Sam is Sam was a rescue dog, so he's somewhere between 12 and 14. He showed up at my house when he was between 2 and 4. and He doesn't walk very fast. We go on what I call sniffs more than walks because he stops and sniffs and stops and sniffs. And as he was sniffing once, I was looking at the ground, and I saw this beautiful little caterpillar. And like I often do to the critters that I see on my walks, I talk to them. And I said, good morning, little caterpillar. The little caterpillar said, good morning. And I said, someday you are going to be a butterfly. And friends, I don't understand it, 
But I could hear that caterpillar clearly say, but today I'm a caterpillar. But today I'm a caterpillar. Yes, my friends, our hope reminds us that better days are ahead, but it also sustains us for where we are today. That's why we can rejoice even in the midst of our sorrow and our weariness because we are indeed a people of hope, even when hope seems lost. You see, that caterpillar reminded me of the importance of being grounded in the hope for today. But what about those times when our head tells us, cognitively we know that God is with us, but our weariness keeps us from feeling it. We pray. We pray. When we can't feel God's presence with us, friends, that's when we most need to get on our knees and pray. We pray and we pray and we pray. Even when we feel like God isn't listening, we still keep praying. You remember the story of the persistent widow found in the book of Luke. She keeps going back to the judge over and over and over asking for justice. Over and over and over she goes back. And finally the judge grants her request. You see, friends, we keep praying, not because God needs to hear our prayer. God heard us the first time we said that prayer. But we need to keep praying for us. We are the ones that need to keep saying that prayer. We need to put our faith in something that is bigger than us, something that is bigger than today, and something that is bigger than the circumstances of our lives right now. Yes, we keep praying. Because of people of faith and hope and love, we know that this, we know that this moment of weariness that we are in is not where we will end up, but it is where we are now. And so even in, no, I should say, especially in these times, God wants us to know that we are not alone. Friends, These are the times that we need God the most. These are the times when our world lets us down, but our Christian faith sustains us. So I encourage you, as Paul did to the Philippians, rejoice. Don't get caught up in the ugliness and the bitterness and the divisiveness of the world. Don't let your weariness get the best of you. As Paul said, focus your thoughts on whatever is true Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, and whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This isn't a be happy, don't worry. This is a these are the things that are worthy of our attention. There's a line from one of my favorite books, the color purple, in which Shug and Celia are walking in the country, and Shug says, and I'm going to change her language just a little bit to make it be language okay from the pulpit. Shug says, I think it makes God mad when you walk by the color purple in a field and you don't notice. But then she goes on to say, people think Pleasing God is all God cares about. But any fool in the world can see that God is always trying to please us back. My friends, that's what Paul is telling us. He's saying, think on these things. Look for the ways that God is trying to please you back. For the ways that God is reaching out and whispering to you, I am with you during these times. Paul says, keep on doing these things and. And, a word that means they go together. Keep doing these things and the God of peace. A peace that surpasses all human understanding will be with you. And that's what it takes, my friends, for us to have peace, 
focusing on God and focusing on God's goodness in all of its many forms. And so, my friends, I, like Paul and Shug, encourage you to notice all the ways that God is with you, all the ways that God shows up when you least expect it. Let God's presence fill your heart with joy. And yes, my friends, joy and pain can occupy the same spot. They are not mutually exclusive. You can experience the pain of the circumstances of life, and at the same time, you can experience the joy of not being on this journey by yourself. You can experience the joy of God's abiding presence. So friends, let's be persistent. Let's pray without ceasing. Pray to have eyes to see and experience God's presence. To have eyes to see all the way that God splashes you with reminders of how much you are loved. Stop often and say thank you every time you see the color purple. And pray that you too may be a vessel of God's presence in a world that is filled with weariness. My friends, my prayer is that our faith allows us to cling to the hope of better days because they are indeed ahead of us. And we stand. We stand on the promise of that blessed assurance that God is going to lead us, not just through today, but through today, through tomorrow, and every day after that. It is indeed in the name of of the one who created us through love, the one who taught us through love, and the spirit that sustains us with love. Amen. Let our prayer be one that is with us always. Come and fill our hearts. It should be on your screen, and I printed the words in your bulletin, but it's in 2157. And Stephen, let's sing this two times. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O oh Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Amen. a chance to respond to that God who gives us hope. And if uh, you have any doubt about hope, you need to be in my position here at the church where I get to do community assistance. People come in hopeless. Sometimes you don't have to give them much. And all of a sudden, they are different people. They are transformed by the love of Christ that you have shown them through your gifts and your offering. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, you give us hope. You give us hope that we can change, that the world can change, that things can get better, and that things can be glorious. We pray today that all those in the world may experience a glimmer of hope and a glimmer of your great transforming power through the gifts that we offer this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Before I introduce our hymn of invitation, Marcia, thank you for reminding us about the ways that we do provide hope for those uh, who often seem hopeless. And I want to tell you a quick story. And Marcia, I don't think I have even shared this story with you. Last week, I was in the parking lot and a gentleman drove up on his bicycle. He was an older middle-aged man that I used to see sitting on these steps out here often. He would come and sit on our steps in the morning and he'd pick up the trash around him and if we had coffee in the coffee pot, I would bring him some coffee and take him out some whatever we had in the pantry. And I would always ask him, do you need anything? Nope, I'm good. And you could just see he was just a very, uh, he was a man that was filled with the love of Christ even though it was a difficult time for him. And then one day he did ask me, he said, Pastor, I hate to ask this, but I can't make my rent. And he said, I'm $200 short. And he said, I don't know what will happen because my grandkids live with us. And I said, we can help you. We can help you. And because of your generosity, we had the money, and so I gave him $200. Um, and then I haven't seen him seven months. But the other day he came up on his bicycle and he said, Pastor, do you remember? First of all, he'd never had a bicycle before. He said, do you remember that you gave me that money? And I said, yeah, I do remember. And he said, that money allowed me to go get a job. And he said, I have a job now, and my grandkids are good, and it's all good. And he said, look, I have a bike that I can drive to, to work in, that I can work on. People, that is because of your generosity and the way that God moves in and through St. Paul's United Methodist Church. So thank you, Marcia, for reminding us of that. Our hymn of invitation, it is indeed our song of hope, it is our hymn of promise. Let's, we're already standing. If you all sat down at home because you were listening to my story, stand back up. You sing joyfully and we'll sing quietly. Hymn of promise. <laughs> send you out on a benediction, I want to say thank you to all of those of you behind the scenes who make this worship service able to be sent out beyond these walls. Thank you, the work that you do, and I know the many, many hours that you put into it, they don't go unnoticed. My friends, know that God sees your weariness. Know that God sees that there are times in your day when the hope seems lost. But my friends, hear these words from God. 
You are my beloved. With you I am well pleased. And with you I will walk every step with you. My friends, feel the peace that surpasses all human understanding. Because, my friends, we are a people that do not put our faith and our hope in the circumstances of the world. We put them in Christ Jesus. Go in peace. Amen. God of hope go with us every day, filling all our lives with love and joy and peace. May the God of justice lead our on our way, bringing light and hope to every land and race. Praying for a world for peace, singing, share our joy with all, working for a world that's new. When we hear Christ children said. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Have a great week.